Thank you. So this will be uh, more like a research a seminar, um, but it is, in the, it is in the line of the previous lecture. So I will talk about the BMS superalgebra at spatial infinity. So I will analyze uh, simple supergravity in four dimensions at spatial infinity. But before I do that, I would like to give a couple of references uh, concerning the previous lectures. So the foundational references on which uh, the general principles of the lectures were based are given in these two papers by Reggie and Teitelboim and then by Ben Guria, Cordero and Teitelboim who clearly introduce a concept of proper and improper gauge transformations and how they appear in the Hamiltonian formalism. And Reggie and Teitelboim were the first, I think, to manipulate uh, in a consistent canonical way surface integrals and show the importance. Um, then I, I mentioned the appearance of, um, ah yes, but they had the canonical symplectic structure. Now the need to have surface terms in the canonical description of uh, electromagnetism was actually, uh, well, I followed exactly the lines of the paper, which is here. Um, then the fact that you can get central charges, as I mentioned, in asymptotic uh, symmetries, uh, where actually, uh, that was, I think, uh, realized in the case of field theory uh, in asymptotic, in the, in the case of field theory, where you have an infinite dimensional asymptotic uh, symmetry algebra at infinity for radius gravity, but that was old work. I also mentioned the, pres the possible presence of nonlinear non terms in the algebra, and this does occur in examples. And uh, actually, uh, the examples are again from ADS3 at higher spin gravity. And I um, know, oh first of all, there was actually ADS3 supergravity, standard supergravity, but extended supergravity, where you get the nonlinear algebras of um, Pratkin, Elinensky, Nisik, uh, and Bershovsky, which appear at, uh, at infinity. And then in the context of higher spin supergravity, more recently it was realized that again, you have also nonlinear terms in the algebra. So in this asymptotic symmetries, nonlinear terms are not really um, an exception or uh, there are many examples where this uh, occurs. I mean, this for the higher spins in, uh, in 3D. And uh, there are other examples that can be uh, uh, shown, given, and actually uh, I will uh, present one here in the case of four-dimensional supergravity um, if, when you analyze things at infinity. Okay, uh, so let me start my lecture. So I want to discuss the, uh, dis the description of the asymptotic structure of supergravity at uh, spatial infinity. And I will discuss some features uh, which are, or which were unanticipated in the structure of the asymptotic symmetry superalgebra. The results are based on joint work with uh, these people. Uh, it's a preprint which uh, appeared uh, recently where uh, there is more than just what I will present here. I will only focus on one particular aspect a more complete analysis uh, can be found there. And I refer to that paper for uh, details, or for some more details. Now, uh, I want to focus here on one specific property of this asymptotic superalgebra that we uh, found, and which is uh, some, well, which is actually that we get a nonlinear algebra. At infinity, infinite dimensional nonlinear uh, extension of uh, the BMS uh, algebra. Um, now, our approach is Hamiltonian, just as my two lectures previously were, and uh, they rely on earlier work done for the uh, unsupersymmetric case of so pure gravity uh, using Hamiltonian techniques with Cedric Troussard, and uh, where we've showed how the BMS four group, which is usually described at null infinity, could actually be understood and was actually present in the uh, description of gravity at spatial infinity. 
Now, uh, the key features which have been, have been outlined in my two, two lectures, so this is not a surprise to you of uh, the approach we were uh, following, are that we carry the analysis in phase space using the formulation, Hamiltonian formulation in the case of uh, gravity, well, of gravity, in the case of supergravity, of supergravity. Um, and we insist that the action be finite, so we will have to put boundary conditions, which I will not write here, but you can devise boundary conditions on the field, which means he, in the case of supergravity, that would be the gravitational field, but also the gravitational field uh, at spatial infinity. And we insist that these boundary conditions be such that the action is finite. So in particular, the kinetic term in the action, which plays such a key role, role in computing brackets and uh, uh, of, of, of uh, generators uh, be well defined and symmetries for us means not only uh, well actually I will look at asymptotic symmetry so I will look at gauge symmetries gauge transformations but they should not just be gauge transformations they should preserve the boundary conditions as I explained in my lectures so they should be actual phase space transformations mapping an allowed phase space configuration on another allowed phase space configuration and the only allowed phase space configurations are those that obey the boundary conditions and uh, with a well-defined uh, canonical structure. So they should preserve also the symplectic structure. And then there is a well-defined moment map. I mean, you can associate a canonical generator to the transformation. And then you can apply standard theorems as I illustrate uh, in the lectures of Hamiltonian mechanics, compute bracket and uh, we get uh, sometimes uh, realizations of uh, symmetry with central charge, sometimes we get nonlinear term, but this is under control through the Jacobi identity which, uh, which does hold. Okay. So as I said, I will only focus on, I mean, it's rather technical. Well, supergravity is technical, the asymptotic analysis of supergravity is another level of technicality. So it's technicalities on technicalities. So I'm not going to write formulas here. Otherwise, I think it would be too technical. And I will only focus on one specific point that we found, uh, well, first of all, we did not expect. So that's why we found it interesting in a sense, and which illustrate also some features of the lectures I gave uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, and which is in the algebra, you will have many Poisson brackets. Well, they are really graded Poisson brackets because we have also fermionic generators, but I will use the terminology Poisson bracket in the general graded sense, which means that it is symmetric when two, two objects of which you are computing the Poisson brackets are uh, fermionic, decommuting. And uh, I will focus on a specific proper on, on, on one very particular uh, Poisson bracket, graded Poisson bracket, the Poisson bracket of two asymptotic supercharges. So the supercharges, so the one associated with supersymmetries. Um, and the constraints on these brackets imposed by the Jacobi identity. Now, uh, so what I call supercharges are the Hamiltonian generators of the local of the supersymmetries. So let me just recall some background on uh, supergravity that the only thing you will need to really know here. And it is that if, well, supergravity as is invariant under diffeomorphism, it's also invariant under local uh, supersymmetry transformations. And if you compute the uh, graded commutator, so and also known as anti-commutator in that case, of two local supersymmetry transformations, you get a diffeomorphism. And the expression of the diffeomorphism in terms of, uh, I guess I should, it is going, yeah. In terms of, so if epsilon two parameterizes, the, the epsilon one parameterizes the first local supersymmetry transformation. So it's a spinner that depends on space time, spin one half, this one also, another spin one half that depends on space time. If you compute the commutator of the corresponding supergravity transformations, you get a diffeomorphism and the parameter of the diffeomorphism. So that's uh, parameterized by a vector field. And here is a vector field. Now, 
of course, we are interested in, in the behavior at infinity of these expressions. And so, well, we, we, we need boundary conditions, but I will not try them explicitly, but let's just have some uh, qualitative for the moment approach to the problem. If you impose that the supersymmetry transformation does not vanish at infinity, but goes to a constant, like it was interesting to do in electromagnetism, for instance, so we had gauge transformations that did not go to zero at infinity, but when I say constant, that means there is a order, order one piece in R, but that can depend on the angles. So if we allow the spinner parameters to go, and there are two, one and two, huh, uh, at infinity this way, then you can compute the diffeomorphism. And the problem you get if you, so this is a naive reasoning. Huh? The problem you get is that this is not going to be a BMS4 transformation. So at infinity, you should get what are the bosonic transformations that you have. Well, you have the BMS4 uh, uh, super translation, and this is not what you don't get a super translation. The reason is very easy to understand. We know that the BMS4 uh, super translations are just parameterized by one single function of the angle. But here you will have four independent in general, if you epsilon one and epsilon two are just two general uh, spinner here, uh, and they have four components, so four components here, four components here. If you just compute this, you will find in general a vector field, which is not in the class of vector fields parametrizing BMS4 super translations. So there is a problem clearly, if you just naively uh, reason, uh, make a reasoning. And this problem can be solved, of course, through imposing, I mean, you have to impose appropriate boundary conditions. I, I wrote this rather naively and superficially. I didn't, I mean, of course, epsilon should be such that some boundary conditions are preserved and um, <clears throat> which will restrict the form of epsilon. And uh, perhaps also we will have to redefine what we mean by a supersymmetry transformation in such a way that in the end we get BMS super translation when we compute the anti-commutator and not an arbitrary diffeomorphism. Okay, so something has to be done. So it just maybe this is a motivation to show that this is not uh, a completely trivial question. We, have, we need some thought, some thinking. Yes? Is it a problem if you keep the epsilons arbitrary and keep more functions? So it's the only problem that you don't get BMS for? Well, the problem is that I get something that if it's not BMS4, it's not preserving the boundary conditions. It doesn't have a canonical generator, and I'm out of the framework. Okay. So, you do, yeah, so you cannot interpret as a generalization. Of, but in any case, this is not what we will get. So I'm just telling you that if we were to get this, it would be a problem. But if you have consistent boundary conditions, this is not what you get. So, uh, but it's just to say that we clearly need something uh, to avoid this. Um, and that would be actually uh, inconsistent. inconsistent. I mean, if our boundary conditions on the spinner field were such that this is what we get, we would, have, we, we would have a problem because they would not preserve the boundary conditions of the boson field. Okay. Now, there are two ways actually to do what I told you to give boundary conditions in which uh, this problem does not arise. And uh, one is given by a finite dimensional supersymmetric extension, which I will briefly survey. And the other one, which is the one I want to discuss, leads to an infinite dimensional supersymmetric extension of the BMS algebra. Okay, I will not write explicitly the boundary conditions, but let me just assert uh, the result. I mean, give the result. One can give asymptotic conditions on the gravity no field in such a way that the parameter of the supersymmetry transformation has to tend to a constant spinner, not just a function on the sphere, but a constant, so only the zero mode uh, on the sphere at infinity. I mean, this is, I mean, you restrict sufficiently the decay of the gravitino field. If you make a supersymmetry transformation, it involves a derivative of the supersymmetry parameter. And if that derivative has to decay sufficiently fast, that means that the leading term of epsilon will have to be a constant. Okay, so that's the way it arises, like somehow, in some of the boundary conditions I showed for electromagnetism yesterday. Uh, 
And then if the spinor tend to a constant, then of course that means that the fermionic transformations, the asymptotic fermionic symmetries will be parametrized by a constant, that means by four independent uh, parameter. So we will have a finite dimensional fermionic extension of the BMS algebra. And actually you can show that uh, these constant parameters are like rigid supersymmetries and they close if you compute the, process, the charges and then the Poisson bracket of the charges, they will close on ordinary translations. Okay, so and ordinary translations are part of the BMS group, so that's fine. And actually this finite dimensional uh, fermionic extension of the BMS group was considered some time ago by uh, Awada, Gibbons and Shaw, and they indicated how it could be realized at null infinity. And that can be extended, uh, or, or that can also be performed at spatial infinity. In, that has been done much more recently in complete, complete agree, agreement with what people found at null infinity. Okay. But I, in a sense, I'm more interested in a more uh, richer, uh, in a richer uh, extension of uh, the BMS uh, algebra. Yes? Yes. What is the BMS uh, group or algebra? Uh -huh. The BMS algebra, you have the Lorentz group, and then you have uh, um, what people call the, the BMS super translations, which are angle dependent translation of, the, of a very specific type uh, that involve only one function of the angle. So this BMS refers to Bondi Mechner stars, and it's an it's an infinite dimensional algebra that contains the Poincaré algebra. And people thought that when they studied the asymptotic structure of gravity, that the symmetry in four dimensions, that the symmetry group would be uh, the Poincaré group, because this is what because these are the symmetries of the background in the space. But it turns out that we get an infinite dimensional extension of the Poincaré group, just like in ADS3. Gravi uh, gravity, where people thought that we would only get the background symmetries of anti-velocity space in three dimensions, so to two, but you get an infinite dimensional extension. A similar phenomenon exists in four-dimensional uh, flat, I mean, lambda equal to zero uh, gravity. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm assuming that this is known, I'm afraid, uh, in this talk. Uh, what else can I say? So the structure of this super translation, I will say a little bit more actually from the point of view of uh, representations of the Lorentz group. So the, this super translation transform in the representations of the Lorentz group that contain the ordinary translations. And people, okay, and, and people actually in the history of general relativity, when people found these extra transformations, it was more an embarrassment than anything else. I mean, people spent a lot of time trying to get rid of them by imposing additional conditions of one sort or of another. And uh, it's really, I think, uh, Strominger who really realized the physical significance of the BS group who could relate the world identities associated with the extra symmetries present in the BMS uh, algebra to uh, world identity. I mean, he could compute them. Relate to corresponding world identities to theorems in quantum theory known as the soft theorems. But is a subgroup of the diffeomorphism group? It is. Yeah, yeah. the diffeomorphism, but uh, if you include diffeomorphism that do not go to zero is infinity. So you include. Yes. But it's infinite dimensional and contains a point away. Uh, so and what we are trying to see is what are the possible fermionic uh, so supersymmetry, I mean, fermionic extension or graded extension of uh, that infinite dimensional algebra. And it's precisely the subgroup uh, of the diffeomorphisms leaving invariant boundary conditions or. It is invariant boundary conditions. It's precisely the subgroup. That's right. And in our case, it is in not only invariant boundary conditions, but also the, the, the symmetric structure and the action. Exactly. Um, um, so as I said now, in, so one can devise more flexible boundary conditions leading to an infinite dimensional fermionic extension. Now this 
inner functions. Actually, we restrict them to be even. They have, well, it's, uh, they are restricted to be even, and they are functions on the two sphere, not just constants. And uh, they are again, uh, they have the similar square root property that we that I wrote on, on previously. They are square roots of BMS super translations in the sense that if you compute the graded commutator, so the anti commutator of two um, supersymmetry transformations, you get a BMS super translation this time. I mean, with the boundary conditions and with the way asymptotically the transformations have to be uh, defined. And uh, well, I will say a few words on this. And the expression of the resulting BMS transformation is given here. So these are the two spinners. Uh, this is the gamma, uh, gamma I matrix. And this is the unit normal to the two spheres. So it's a function of the angles. And these are the T and W corresponding to the anti-commutator. Uh, okay. So I'm using the Hamiltonian parametrization of the BMS super translations, T and W, which was uh, clarified in, in this paper and some formula made ex more explicit in, in that other paper. And so the corresponding diffeomorphism in terms of T and W, so it's, it's a special diffeomorphism, which is parametrized by, if I take the normal, the unit normal to, to the hypersurfaces, I'm Hamiltonian, this is actually precisely T. And if I take the tangential uh, part of the diffeomorphism, it's given in terms of W by this formula, where this is the radial coordinate. So to leading order, there will be some subleading terms, but they are not important for the asymptotic analysis. And T and W are odd, are even and odd, and somehow can be related, but the transformation is, uh, has been worked out here, uh, can be related to the familiar parameter called alpha in the description of super translation at null infinity. Now, alpha is a, an arbitrary function on the two sphere. It has an even and a not part, and somehow the even plays a role here, and the odd plays a role here, but the connection is more than just decomposing alpha into even and not part. Okay, but what I, the message I want to give here is that with these new boundary conditions, and I'm aware I'm not writing them explicitly, but they can be written they are in the paper. If you compute and the supersymmetry transformations as they are defined, okay, so uh, you find that if you make two such supersymmetry transformations, you get a BMS super translations with these parameters. And what I want to stress to say now, and this is really the main point I want to develop of, uh, I want to develop on my, in my talk is that actually this formula I wrote seems to be, must be, well, it, it seems that it should be incorrect because it, it raises, uh, 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 it seems to be in conflict with the Jacobi identity. And I, spe I spent a lot of time in my previous two lectures that once you def saying and explaining that once you define things using standard canonical methods, the Jacobi identity is something that holds. So there is a paradox. Uh, I will explain the paradox, and actually that's the only thing that I will explain. Um, and then I will uh, tell you how it is really not present, so uh, how it is solved. I mean, well, it's not really solved because it was never there in a sense, but uh, I will explain the uh, confusion that you might, that one can have. But to do that, I need to uh, make a detour in the theory of infinite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group because we are dealing with infinite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group. The super translations are functions on the two spheres that transform in some way under the Lorentz group, but it's place of functions on the two sphere is infinite dimensional. And if you have spinner defined on the two sphere, it's also an infinite dimensional uh, space. And that's an infinite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. So let me say a few words on the infinite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group. This is what I just said. And so I will use a notation. Okay, so this has been studied by mathematicians some time ago. Here are the names, Gelfand and Neymark and Aris Sandra. And I will follow here the conventions and the terminology of Gelfand and Neymark in the presentation. Okay, so here is the Lorentz algebra. You recognize 
So I have the rotations, which they denoted, and hence I'm also denoted A. And then they have uh, the boost, which they denote and I denote B, okay? And the rotations form a subalgebra. Boost transform in the vector representation of the rotation group and the commutator of two boost give you a rotation. Now, these are the generators with, uh, which are, I mean, this would be anti-emission, so it's useful to put an I and to, well, this we know very well. Uh, some, usually people call that J3, J plus, J minus, but I'm using the notations as I told you. So this would be the uh, standard redefinitions of the angular momentum uh, along uh, the third axis, raising, lowering, and then you do a similar redefinition of the boosts generators. And uh, I, I will not develop the theory here. I'm just giving you the result. So Gelf and I just follow Gelfan and Neymar. Uh, they show that, uh, bec well, that's also easy to understand. Since SO3 is a compact algebra of the largest algebra, any representation of the bigger algebra SO31, be it finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, will decompose as a direct sum of representation of that compact of algebra. And L will be the spin. So they use a terminology weight uh, for, the, for the spin. So these are not the eigenvalues of, the, uh, of J3, but uh, okay. So this is really the spin of the representation. So the spin of, uh, and uh, the weight we know very well. So the spin can be, uh, it's a non-negative integer or, or half integer. And the sum in general will be infinite. For most representations of the Lorentz group, and in particular, actually, for the unitary ones, except the trivial one, it's infinite dimensional. As they also show, showed that if the uh, representation R of SO31 is irreducible, each representation of RL, which occurs in the decomposition, can only appear once, not degenerate. So maybe it doesn't appear at all, but if it appears, it can only appear once. Uh, now, then to classify and the representations, it's useful to introduce the lowest SO3 spin that, that occurs in the decomposition of R, which they call L0. So L0 is an integer or a half integer, which is non-negative. And uh, then they label, the, I mean, then they show that the only other values of the spin of the SO3 spin that uh, can appear differs from L0 by one unit. So you would have L0 plus one, L0 plus two, L0 plus three, et cetera. And it will stop, of course, if the representation is finite dimensional, and if no, there is no upper bound. It goes on forever. You have higher and higher and higher SO3 spins. And then they present explicitly all the matrix elements of all the operators, so they completely characterize the representations. Um, of course, these are the familiar uh, representation of the angular momentum of uh, SO3. Uh, you know, observe, because this is what they do, that uh, if you rescale all the basis vector Xi LM by a function that depends only on L, these relations will be unchanged because of course the spin L is unchanged. So it's the same on both sides. And this is something which is uh, actually useful to recall. Yes. Is, uh, is it not unitary? Okay. So, but it is unitary, right? Or not? Sometimes it is. It depends, I will say, it depends on the value of L0 and L1. Uh, L0, L1, which I have not yet introduced. It can be unitary, it can be non-unitary. For the moment, I'm not discussing this, but I will tell you when it is unitary. But this SO3 representation... SO3 oh, is unitary. Okay. Yeah, all unitary. So if you have a okay. sum of unitary ones, what I mean, if you have a sum of unitary ones, what goes wrong? Uh, be unitary? Well, you have uh, you need also the other generate Lorentz generators to be yes. uh, non-compact ones to be unitary. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. but, but it's true. I mean, uh, for the finite dimensional compact Lie group SO three things are unitary, and I'm just and these are just the familiar uh, formulas. Now, to write the matrix elements of the BIs, so of the boost generators or the Fs, which is the same. Well, they are using, they use the fact that by the wigner eckhart theorem, well, the commutation relations tell us that these are vector operators. So we know that they can only connect uh, different spins 
a spin that will differ by at most by plus or minus one. So this will have matrix elements elements only with xi uh, L prime and prime, where L prime can only take these three values. You can well either it leaves L unaffected or changes by minus one or plus one. Okay. And uh, they computed uh, the thing, and uh, after suitable uh, normalization, here is here are the matrix elements of the F3, F plus, F minus. Don't uh, try to remember them or whatever. I'm writing this to, first of all, to show that an explicit formula exists. And second of all, to show that there are two parameters which appear here, which depends on the representation. I mean, actually, it's an inf I mean, for each L, I have two parameters, AL and CL. So I will give you immediately the values of AL and CL. They depend on L0, which I already explained, and some other parameters L1. So there are two parameters that completely describe the, unit, the, sorry, the representation of the Lorentz group, L0, which is a minimum value of the SO3 spin, and some other parameter L1, which can be an arbitrary complex number. For any value, com complex value for of L1, you do get a representation. So any representation of the Lorentz group is characterized by a pair of number, which somehow appear symmetrically in the formulas, as you can see. Um, but there is no complete symmetry because L0, the lowest SO3 spin, is a non-negative integer or half integer, while L1 can be an arbitrary complex number. And uh, well, this is what I just said. Now, uh, just, but maybe I should uh, not spend too much time on that because the representation will be finite dimensional if the series stops. And if you look at the expression for L, for CL, well, it will stop when L reaches the value, well, it could stop because L is always greater than L0, you are increasing, except of course, when L is equal to L0, uh, this is just tell you that there, you cannot lower the spin, but L0 was a minimum value, so this is actually a consistency condition. But then you can see that it could potentially also vanish when L is equal to L1, okay? Which means that this can only happen if L1 is an integer which uh, differs from L0, by, sorry, if L1 is a number that differs from L0 by an integer, since we are raising always by one. Okay, so L, L and then we will have some maximum value of the spin, which is given by that, uh, correspond to that value of L1. So this is what I just wrote here. And then you would have some highest uh, SO3 spin occurring the, in the representation. But if L1 does not differ from L0 by an integer, the thing never stops, and you have an infinite dimensional representation of the Lorentz algebra. Now, to get a unitary representation, this is not too complicated to, to verify, because already, as you said, for SO3, we know it's unitary, so you have only to worry about the boost. And, but you have the explicit expression for the boost, so you can compute using, uh, uh, and you find that it's unitary in only two cases. Either L1 is pure imaginary, and zero I regard as pure imaginary, so I mean it's part of, uh, uh, and then there is no restriction on L0, and this they call the main or principal series, or uh, L0 is equal to zero, and L1 is a real number between minus one and one, which is a simplementary series, and they wrote a lot of uh, interesting formulas about these unitary representations, but in a sense, uh, we will deal with also with non-unitary representation, so uh, this is just information. And if you want also to be finite dimensional, we know, as we well know, only the trivial scalar representation of the, of, the, of the Lorentz group, in which you have only one state, is unitary. Okay, now, why am I talking about this? Well, because I will be dealing with infinite dimensional representation of the uh, Lorentz group. And the first one I have is the one given by the BMS super translations. Now, I describe the BMS supertranslations in terms of an even function T and a not function uh, W. 
but there is a different, you can go to a different basis of the BMS algebra in which things are described by a single function on the two sphere. Clearly it has the same amount of information, which transform into the Lorentz group as follows, where these are, um, so these are functions on the two sphere. These are the killing vectors of rotations which are tangent on the two sphere. So this is a well-defined operation. The two sphere, I mean, the rotation groups act on the two sphere. And then for the boost, well, actually there is, as we know, a conformal action, but uh, there is, you can show that the boost function B, which occurs in the generator of the, of the boost, I call it B, uh, it's a function of the angles only because XI, XI over R is actually the unit normal. So that's a function of the, of, of the angle. And you can show that this is indeed a representation of the Lorentz algebra, no matter what, uh, yeah, a representation of the Lorentz algebra. Okay, and I just explain here what B is. It's called what, it's what we call a multiplier representation because you have the transport term, but then you have also some uh, weight term and in our case, k is equal to one, but you, you could have different values of k. You can show this is still a representation. K, and you can show that the re representation is not irreducible, it is reducible. There is a sub, there is an invariant subspace, which is four dimensional, and it contains a, a constant and the first spherical harmonics, I and mean, it's natural to decompose functions on the sphere in spherical harmonics. You can show using the previous formula that this will be invariant and it yields the vector representation of the Lorentz group where L0 is equal to zero. The smallest SO3 spin is uh, zero, as we know. I mean, it's a four component object. There is a temporal component and the three spatial component. And then the next value of the spin is L equal one, and then it stops, and it can stop only if L1 is just the last value plus one, so it's true in this case. Okay, so that's a vector representation, and these are the ordinary translations, which of course form by themselves a representation of the Lorentz group, I mean. But then you can look at the quotient representation, you have an invariant subspace, look at the quotient representation, it's irreducible, infinite dimensional, so that would contain what we call the proper super translations. And the value, the corresponding value of the representation are, and that's actually interesting, and I don't, well, I mean, this is just an observation at this stage. These are just the dual value. You exchange L1 and L0. And actually, uh, people, and I think this is a terminology that goes to uh, uh, Gelfan and Neymar, you call this infinite dimensional representation the tail of the finite dimensional representation with L0 equal to zero and L1 equal to two. This one uh, you call the head, okay? the tail and the, the tail, the infinite dimensional one and the head. And it turns out that in this case, but I, again, I cannot really say if this is important or not, uh, the values of L0 and L1 are such that the representation is, the tail is unitary. Uh, now the full representation is not the direct sum of this one plus the quotient. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's not completely reducible. So it's an indecomposable representation, although it is uh, reducible. So it's reducible, but not completely reducible uh, because if you take the bracket of two objects here, in the tail, you will get something in the head. Yes? Why is this one unitary? You said before a principal series was L1 imaginary or it is a L0, uh, imaginary including L0 equal to one, uh, zero. So the whole imaginary axis. But L1 is not imaginary here. Uh, no, no, but that's L1 is zero. <laughs> Uh -huh. <coughs> so this one is unitary. This is uh, okay. the head. The finite dimensional one is not unitary, uh -huh. but the corresponding infinite dimensional tail is unitary. Is there a reason for that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. This is what I just said. Actually, and this, okay, I, I wrote things in terms of tau, and previously I was using T and W, but it's really a, a change of basis. So 
because if you change the basis, you, are, you still have the same representation. Now, since we are dealing with supersymmetry, we need spinner representation. Now the spinner representation relevant to uh, descri describing the spinner charges, it's a spinner function, I theta phi, but so this is a, a spinner, actually a Meyer and a spinner, so four compo real components on the two sphere, which is even. And there is some transformation under the Lorentz group that you can write, which I wrote here, so it's a bit complicated. This is the part which is uh, probably uh, easy to understand, just the derivative of a spinner on the, along the vector, the rotation vectors, okay? So that part is fine, but then we have something like the derivatives for the, of, along the boost, but written in terms of, um, of chi itself. So this is the way it, it does transform. You can check that this indeed is a representation of the Lorentz group. What is this? irreducible content, so it's again. Well, the content, well, you can show that if chi is even under the, the inversion I discussed yesterday, the parity transformation discussed yesterday, that's compatible with this transformation. So if you want to have, a, uh, so it's consistent to take chi even, and this is actually the relevant values, value for what we uh, consider, we, for, for our discussion, except me, this representation is again irreduce, uh, not irreducible, so it is reducible, but it's not decomposable, and it again contains a finite dimensional head and an infinite dimensional tail. The finite dimensional head, well, we are dealing with spinners, it would just be uh, the spin one half representation of the Lorentz group, so characterized by L0 equal to one half which is the minimum value of the SO3 spin. Well, it's actually also the maximum value of the SO3 spin. So L1, which is always the maximum value plus one is three half. And then there is an infinite dimensional tail, uh, which corresponds to the quotient representation. And the quotient representation is uh, again the dual values. But in that case, because L1 is not imaginary, it's not unitary. Uh, now, um, yes, and also from the point of view of the subalgebra SO3, the representation is of course completely uh, decomposable, but if you look at this as, as a representation, oops, but as representation of the Lorentz algebra, it is indecomposable. You cannot write the representation as a direct sum of uh, representations. Okay, now, now the paradox and then the solution for the understanding. Uh, as I told you, the fermionic symmetries close on super translations according to this rule. And this is just what you get. So let me perhaps, I, I'm not very, I did not write many formulas because I think writing formulas would not have been very enlightening because the formulas are rather involved. So let me tell you how we get this expression, this expression. So we have an expression for the generators of supersymmetry transformation. There is a constraint associated with supersymmetry, and then we need a surface term. And the way we determine the surface term is because we have imposed some boundary conditions of the fermions, and we, we, we need to supplement the generator proportional to the constraint by uh, a surface term so that the formulas I wrote yesterday and the day before yesterday do apply. So there is some surface term. And, um, and then once we have the generator, so everything, so, so there are asymptotic conditions hidden behind the computation, but you can write them. Huh? So we have written the boundary conditions, we have written the generators, and then we computed the Poisson bracket of two generators. And we found that the Poisson bracket of two generators uh, lead to a new transformation with super translations parameterized by these expressions. Now, this actually is inconsistent, as I will explain, and it's inconsistent with the Jacobi identity because the expression we get for this product and this, so these expressions do not transform like super translations should transform under the Lorentz algebra. So we have epsilon one and epsilon two have some definite representation rule, uh, transformation rules, which I told you what they are. We just compute this. And we find that these expressions 
do not transform like the T and the W of a um, parameterizing supertransition. So there is a clash between transformation rules and this clash is actually, and this is well known and I will recall why, is actually uh, inconsistent with Jacobi identity, which means that something uh, is incorrect because Jacobi identity is correct. So I will have to, okay, so again, you have to believe me when I told you that, you see, you have infinite dimensional representations. So we know how each transform. So uh, if I make a boost and I compute the transformation rule of that, I'm telling you that I will not get, and similarly for this, I will not get the transformation rule that T and W should have. Okay, so this formula is incomplete or something is, is missing in the reasoning, but let me tell you why this would be in conflict. If this was the final answer, this would be in conflict with the Jacob identity. Now, this formula seems to be very natural from what I told you when people studied supersymmetries, supersymmetry, local supersymmetry, they immediately they computed the commutator of two local supersymmetries and they got a diffeomorphism that was essentially, even by that, now this has been improved to take into account boundary conditions and we have restricted the set of diffeomorphisms to BMS transformation, but still, I mean, it has the same flavor as the thing that I wrote uh, that people have, uh, have gotten. So somehow this is not really a um, question in a sense, this formula, but, but there is a problem with the transformation rule. So what is, how does, First of all, why is this in conflict with the Jacobi identity? And then how is that solved? Now, I should say that it's conflict with the Jacobi, it's conflict with the transformation. I mean, the transformation rules are, do not match only for the tails. So this really is the infinite dimensional part that is problematical. The finite dimensional part, so where you only restrict, if you restrict epsilon to the finite uh, spin one half representation, you don't include the higher harmonics, here the same, then you will get something which belongs to the finite dimensional uh, transla ordinary translation representation, spin one representation of the Lorentz group. Well, this would be the first spherical harmonic proportional to an, an I, and this would be constant. So indeed, they, together they form the four dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. It's really due to the, uh, and, and we get the characteristic uh, uh, square root properties of supersymmetry is a square root of uh, translation and of, uh, of, tran of space-time translations, huh? that the bracket the anti-commutator of two rigid supersymmetry is a, is a rigid translation, but which is described in this language in the BMS context. So the problem, there is no problem with the heads and no problem with the Jacob identity. I mean, this would, we would know. But uh, the problem is really with the tails, with the in the infinite dimensional part of the representations. And why it is in conflict with the Jacobi identity, what I told you is that, and again, I, want, I will be schematical. The Jacobi identity, well, relates, I mean, it's a, it's a sum of cyclic term with appropriate signs, because we have fermionic generators, uh, Q, Q, F, and then you would have, uh, you would have Q, F, Q, and then you would have FQQ. Okay, I've, I've rewritten it this way because, uh, and of course there is, uh, actually it's an equality, it's probably a, a strict equality in this case, but, uh, and, but this is a graded uh, Poisson bracket. So you, get, you have that, huh? I'm just using the Jacobi identity, but I, I, put, I keep some terms in the left-hand side and some other terms in the right-hand side. Because the left-hand side uh, is really the commutator of QQ, which we have seen will give me, well, the generator of a super translation, so T and w, the generator corresponding to T and W with F. So that will be, we are now in the representation of the BMS super translation. So this is, uh, this is known because we know how super translations or BMS super translation transform. And this is, now we are looking at the representation of the spinner. So I transform the spinner, epsilon one and epsilon two, epsilon one here, epsilon two here, and uh, I compare the two. And I told you, oh, they are not equal. 
But if this is not equal to that, the Jacobi identity is fails. See, because the Jacobi, the Jacobi identity, well, one way to express it in this case is that in the tensor product of the two fermionic representations, we should get the super translation representation. And with the formula that we have, uh, well, they, this is not what we get. This is what I, what I said. So there is a conflict with the Jacobi identity. And I told you the whole formalism is developed so that the Jacobi identity holds, so uh, because we are, can apply standard theorems of classical mechanics. So what is going on? And the, what is failing in the argument is that the bracket QF, which we thought was, would just give the transformation rule of spinners in this uh, fermionic representation of the Lorentz group, is actually modified by quadratic terms. And if you do things more precisely, which I'm just catching you here, the, the general uh, way it goes, um, there is in fact a second fermionic symmetry, which I have called G. So asymptotically at infinity, so we have two sets of asymptotic fermionic symmetries, which does transform on the boost as expected and the representation I indicated, and which anticommutes with Q so the transformation is anti-commute, but if you go to the generator, there is a central charge, non-vanishing. So the transformations commute or anti-commute, I should say, we have fermionic transformations, but the corresponding generator, as we know, can happen, have a non-vanishing central charge. So I have an extra generator QS such that QS is one, and the bracket of so, which is read really uh, this bracket, which tells me how Q transforms on the boost. Recall that in my notations, which are Gelfand and Neymar's notations, boosts were denoted by F with the redefinitions. So, if I compute this bracket, it turns out that it contains the expected, well, it contains uh, the expected term plus some nonlinear term. And these linear terms are what save the Jacobi identity. Because if you uh, take that into account with the Jacobi identity, so, but now of course we are out of the context of linear realization. We have this extra term and we have to think of Q and S together now also. And all of them together in this, uh, because T also appears. Well, actually you have T and you have W which appears, but somehow I only wrote T here. Uh, you can show that at least it has the right structure for uh, modifying these things that didn't work um, in, um, in the appropriate way. Because you, if you now compute what appears in the Jacobi identity, you, you take the bracket with a second Q, you will get QQ, which produces trans super translations. Okay? But then there will be a contribution coming from here. And because Q with S is one, and Q with T is zero, I mean, uh, translations commute with supersymmetry transformations, uh, you will get a term proportional to T with some coefficients. And it turns out that it's only when you take into account the two contributions that you get something that transforms as, uh, as, as T. So in other words, it's um, to save or to, well, I should not say to save because in a sense it was never in danger it's just that we did not understand. But to, to, under, to understand why the Jacobi identity holds, you cannot neglect these quadratic contributions, which are fundamental in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, this, in this particular contribution, okay, which was problematical. Okay. Now, yes, so, so this is the solution. Yes? Can I ask you, uh, why would one even want to neglect something that is non-zero? I mean, what... what uh... Well, you see, no, of course one cannot neglect. Right. But you see, it was natural to think that the supercharge would transform in, the linear, in a linear representation of the... I see. Okay. Because that's somehow, well, of course, this was an a priori, which was not correct. So the a priori is motivated by experience, but experience can be dangerous with supergravity. Let's see. 
So, so this is an action. Of course, this, well, one, one cannot neglect something which is not zero. So this is not zero, it is there, but it's nice to understand why it is there. And it is there precisely because if it was not there, we would have a conflict. We, and not there would mean that we have a linear, that this would Q would transform, so if this is not there. I mean, I, there are some, there is a, the matrix of the transformations here, which I'm not writing. Uh, this transform under boost as a spinner. So they are extra terms, which are present. And thanks to this extra term, everything works well as it sh should work. But you know, sometimes, you see, when we got these, when you have these quadratic terms, you might say maybe it's a result of a, of a mistake. So this would be a nonlinear action on the vector space. That's right. And if you if you forget about that term, can you realize the structure that you had before? Uh, I mean, the Jacobi identity doesn't hold, but maybe you know there well, are higher there are higher versions. I think you can probably exactly. work modulo s. So this would but be it's a bit dangerous uh, to work modulo s because as as a non-vanishing bracket. So I mean, to set s equal to zero before or after you compute the bracket is a bit tricky. But I think you can. You can probably define things modulo s if you are careful enough. Okay, thank you. Now, one reason also why we did not expect uh, this term to begin with is that we looked at the linear uh, theory, the free theory first, which is polyphirts plus so polyphirts for the spin two and Rarita Schwinger for spin three half, and this term is not there. You can again have boundary conditions which, in, which allow for an infinite dimensional uh, uh, fermionic uh, not improper gauge, for infinite dimensional uh, fermionic improper gauge symmetries, but if they turn out to, uh, and then when you compute uh, the corresponding Poisson bracket of the algebra, the nonlinear term is not present. So there is no contradiction in that case because it's a linear theory and the uh, anti-commutator of two fermionic symmetries gives zero. So there is no, there are no square root of the BMS super translation. You need to go to the nonlinear theory to find this phenomenon. Um, actually, I should say that this algebra, which in a sense is poorer because there are many zeros, if you don't get square root of super translations, can be realized also in the nonlinear theory with different boundary conditions, but somehow it's, uh, Poorer subalgebra, uh, superalgebra. Okay, and in that case, only the heads, which are the familiar heads, which is a finite dimensional case, have square roots, but the tails would not have square roots. Okay, so uh, I think it's time to conclude. So I, re I realize I've been rather catchy, but at least I have tried to give you the message that nonlinear terms in asymptotic algebras can and do occur. Okay, now let me summarize. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, there exist in equivalent formulations of supergravity at infinity, which are defined by different sets of boundary conditions. So boundary conditions are needed to completely define the theory. And one yields that small graded extension of the BMS4 algebra with a finite number of fermionic generators. And the other, set of boundary conditions yields a much bigger gradient extension of the BMS4 algebra with an infinite number of fermionic generators, which form square roots of super translations in the sense that the anti-commutator of two fermionic symmetries give you uh, a generic uh, BMS4 super translation, but they have nonlinear term in the Poisson bracket. Uh, and both contain uh, a subalgebra in both cases, both sets of boundary conditions, the super Poincare algebra, which in the fermionic sector is restricted to the head. And then we have that uh, fermionic fermionic is at bosonic. There is this, no, not this problem of nonlinear terms. The nonlinear terms are associated with the, with the tails, with the infinite dimensional part of the fermionic uh, representations. So we see that nonlinear terms and actually also central charges, it's, it's another example of a central charge, can appear in the algebra of asymptotic symmetries and do appear. And they are constrained, of course, by the Jacobi identity, just like in system with a finite number of dimensions. And they are, in fact, unavoidable in some instances. Now, uh, 
the reason why I've put a, quote, a question mark here is that you might ask the question maybe by redefinitions, which are nonlinear redefinitions, we could uh, redefine away this nonlinear term. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, we can try to approach the problem through different routes. One route, but it's uh, at least for me, it's uh, formidable is you could say, well, I have two fermionic, I mean, I have a fermionic representation. I take the tensor product with fermionic representation. And then I just look whether in the decomposition of that tensor product, I have the representation of the super translations. The problem is that I have two infinite dimensional representations given by functions on the sphere. So when I take the tensor product, I, I, I would have functions on the product of two, two spheres. And then, uh, well, Neymar has written theorems on decomposition of tensor product of infinite dimensional representations, but they are extremely hard to, to swallow. And I don't know uh, if the answer to the tensor product decomposition is uh, yes or no. But what I know is that with the definitions that we have taken of the super, uh, with our boundary conditions and hence with the resulting uh, supersymmetries, fermionic symmetries that we get at infinity, these terms are necessary because otherwise there is a clash with the Jacobi identity as I explained. So uh, maybe by redefinitions we could redefine them away but we have also to keep in mind that we want to keep some form of locality. So we cannot take any set of redefinitions. We, are, we have constraints, but okay, that's just, I think it's very unlikely, but uh, I just, I just to be cautious, I put a question mark. Uh, that's what I already said. And I think that as we I already commented at the beginning, this is not the first instance where nonlinear algebra appear. And um, I will, with that, I will thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. We have time for questions. So I would invite the online participants to just raise their hands if they have a question and first ask for questions here. Um, so you mentioned the field spiraling just towards the end, the field spiraling action, right? But I thought the rest of the discussion was in the massless case, or at least when there's no master. I'm sorry, but I did not hear the question. The field spiraling that you mentioned towards the end. Yes. Why? I mean, I thought the rest of the discussion was performed was the massless case where there's no mass term. Yeah, this is massless. Yes, I, I want to have a local supersymmetry. And I'm not in, in the ADS context, I'm in the asymptotically in context. Okay, so there is also for the value that there must be a mass term. Yeah, I think I don't think that the mass term in the Rari Tashwinger uh, action will help. Uh, so what we did with the Rari Tashwinger field, we, we well, this is a gauge theory, and we define a symptom. So we looked at it as a gauge theory in flat Minkowski space. And we looked at, we gave asymptotic boundary conditions. And we looked at the, oops. Uh, we looked at the uh, gauge transformations of the Rarita Schlinger theory that preserve the boundary conditions. And in the Rarita Schlinger theory, the local gauge transformations, which will become the supersymmetries, are abelian. And so the commutator, you expect the commutator to be zero, which is indeed what happens. So you will not get square roots of super translations. In a sense, we were looking after square roots of super translations. So that's why, uh, of all, not just ordinary translations, this we know. But we wanted to have also fermionic symmetries, the anti commutator of which would be a non trivial uh, Q, as it's called, BMS4 super translations. Another question. I was wondering whether uh, these nonlinear non terms you get uh, could be seen as arising from some limit of the some operator or symmetry generator and their infinity. Okay, the connection with null infinity has not been done, and I think it's very uh, interesting. I 
Well, I think it's too early to, to comment, but I think that indeed there should be some uh, understanding of no infinity. I believe, well, actually, uh, I believe that this is related to um, all these entities involving uh, the bleeding of theorems. The bleeding of gravitino theorem? Uh, yeah, in a sense, S is a fermionic, yes. Mm -hmm. Why does it bleeding? Well, the way it's constructed. And also, I think that there should be some triangular uh, thing that. Uh, if the way it's constructed, we see that we are, we are exploring uh, some lower, I mean, more higher power of some uh, So, again, about this uh, Jacobi identity. So, uh, in the usual sense, you can say, okay, I have a set of charges and I associate the algebra or the algebra action. Uh, <clears throat> typically, if you have a structure where the Jacobi identity doesn't hold, you can try to make it into a lead to algebra. So there is some underlying Q manifold that describes either the algebra action or the lead to algebra action. Do you think that here something like this might be hiding underneath? Uh, uh, I don't know because somehow the Poisson bracket should satisfy strictly the way they are defined the, the Jacobi identity. So. But it might be interesting, for, well, I don't know, possible to uh, develop a theory in which you work modulo S, and then Jacobi identity would probably be fulfilled modulo S or something that consistently goes with S. And then everything would be modulo something else. It occurs. I don't know. This we have not explored. In your version, these are charges that Algebra, so this, this is a Poisson algebra, yeah. and so you are just computing the Poisson bracket of two charges, and you get not just something linear in the charges, which is what we were expecting because we were expecting the spinner to transform under representation, linear representations of the, the Lorentz algebra, but we do get something else. So they only transform in linear representation modulus is S. Last question. So maybe a general question. So do you have an interpretation for this uh, tail uh, at space like infinity? Because uh, somehow at null, uh, we try to give this interpretation a soft degrees of freedom. So you have uh, somehow a transition between Barqua, but this is, uh, it's related to the presence of gravitational radiation. So in the case of space like infinity, uh, in, well, they are there, so they are consistent boundary so conditions. They are natural know, because I, they are related. I would say that, well, I don't have done the interpretation, but all theorems on the asymmetric can be derived using the Antonin form. They were, I mean, all identities were derived using the Antonin form. So if you can relate some soft theorems to symmetries, you can do that. I mean, you should, the asymmetric, people defined it using. Uh, and the, the reason being that uh, space like hypersurfaces uh, contain all the information, including gravitational radiation information. It's maybe not the best place to study gravitational radiation, but information is recorded in the environment as well. So the exact translation is difficult to make because to integrate that, you need to integrate the equation from Cauchy hypersurface to non infinity. And we know that for generic initial data satisfying the boundary conditions, we will start having logarithmic term. I mean, it will be a poly logarithmic expansion. We would have logarithmic log. Generically, there is one over r, but then you would have also log r over r squared, log r squared over r cubed, and all this type of thing. And at not infinity. And uh, now, if you explore further, and, I, and since I think we are exploring the structure further and further, these are our term will matter in the analysis. So nice thing of spatial infinity are one nice thing that I mean there are advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is that we don't have to worry, I mean there is no log term. The log term develops when you integrate the equations of motion. I mean there is no logarithmic log r term in the expansion towards spatial infinity. They may even capture more information in this sense because uh, 
uh, some information that may be related to the polarly logarithmic expansion that is not there in the uh, in many well, analysis and well, I think it's you know I think it's premature to say but indeed I mean the philosophy is that on a Cauchy microsurface everything is recorded. Now, it doesn't mean that it's easy to, to find it, but uh, it might be very difficult. Huh? So, of course, non infinity is a uh, useful tool. And, uh, but uh, everything is there, and in particular, we know that uh, soft theorems were derived by uh, Weinberg and, uh, and the collaborators without knowing about Penrose's work on non infinity. Uh, a question. Is, is, it, uh, is, it, is it understood as a re-algebraid? Uh, not re-algebra. Uh, anyway, this algebra satisfies the identity, so... Uh, I don't know. Uh, so the breaking of Jacobi identity is... Uh, uh, deformed to be algebraic. Is it right? Well, I, I'm not sure I understood the question, but indeed, the algebra of the charge is not only really algebra because of these nonlinear terms, but and so that enters into the, the category which is uh, different. But I'm not sure that this was uh, is it was it a question or a comment? <laughs> Okay, uh, I, a, maybe I, yeah, half a uh, question, the half with the comment. Okay, so <laughs> uh, then I agree with you that uh, it, it, it's, uh, well, you can make it into a Lie algebra if you say, oh, I have a new generator, which is a product SQ. I mean, that, whatever uh -huh. is not already there, you include, but uh, that's probably not the best way to proceed. Yeah, but, uh, okay. If we impose the Jacobi identity, it, anyway, this is the personal algebra and it means the uh, real algebra. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is maybe it is the comment. But I, I'm not sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>